I'm hearing dead air. Is there anything else? Just yammering on. <laughs> Darn mute buttons. They keep moving them around. So just to make a point about the curriculum rules, having requisite rules in, um, or program requirement rules in curriculum management versus degree audit, I think we're seeing sort of two different needs emerging. <laughs> having them in curriculum management, um, if institutions choose to enter in curriculum management, they can take advantage of things like dependency analysis. Um, you'll need them definitely for courses in order to enforce course prerequisites at the, at the enrollment offering, um, or the course offering level, rather. So those are two things um, you need it for. Also saying because we have a natural language representation of our rules, um, that on the program side, program requirements, it would be easy to create program descriptions um, directly from the encoded rules or maybe planning worksheets for students. Um, but we do recognize that they're probably not sufficient to the level of detail that you might actually be able to run an audit against them the way you can over in DARS, that it needs additional coding. So I know it's a little confusing. We actually have a white paper on it that I'm happy to send out, or maybe I'll attach um, to the wiki page. It kind of explains our degree audit strategy and how we see the curriculum management rules intersecting with, with, um, with program audit rules. So why don't I do that? Why don't I put the white paper on the wiki page and then um, that way it's available for everybody to read. And explains the, our current thinking on, on that. Mute. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, I'm hearing a lot of dead air as well. Are we done? Are there any other questions? Hi, Carol. It's Nina from South Africa. Um, can you hear me? I can. Um, sorry, I've missed most of the presentation. Um, but I do have one question. My understanding is program is part of curriculum management and program offering is part of enrollment. Um, I'm just curious why program offering is not part of curriculum management as well, because surely it's kind of curriculum management. It's not. Uh, boy, Nina, that's some question there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it's it's actually not, because any time you think about what's, what's in curriculum management is what's approved for offering. It doesn't mean you're actually going to offer it. I mean, we all have things on the books that we don't actually make available to students. And that tends to make a lot more sense in the context of courses, but the, really the analog applies to programs. I mean, you could have a program that's approved for offering, but you just don't actually make it available for students to attach to. So, and maybe this is a little bit of historical precedent, but in the quality world, it's always been, the catalog's always been about the canonical, curriculum management's always been about the canonical, and enrollment's always been about the actual instantiation of its canonical offerings and then attaching students to that. So it, I mean, I kind of get your point. It's a bit of a gray area, but offering really is about, enrollment really is about making whatever the institution is allowed to offer, actually going through the process of offering those things and attaching students to them, be they courses, programs, or anything else. I don't know if that adequately addresses your question. Yeah, I suppose it doesn't really matter that much. It, it just, I suppose I was thinking more in a logical way. Yeah, I think it was probably, I mean, we probably... Yeah, I mean, we probably, I think when we originally tackled um, quality student and, and curriculum management initially, I mean, back in the day it was called learning unit management. <laughs> we didn't even call it curriculum yeah. management because we were really super abstracted. And it was always this idea of like creating learning units as opposed to creating learning unit instances, you know, and so there was always this Lou Louie division and, and um, I think as we've moved to a more business friendly way of thinking about things as opposed to a very sort of abstracted way of thinking about things. We may have said 
it really kind of makes more sense to instantiate programs in the curriculum as opposed to, you know, as part of the enrollment module, but we didn't. <laughs> so um, that's where we are. Okay. Okay. So no, I think it's a bit of curious. a combination of, like, history and, and sort of a purist view of the catalog. You know, from a very purist view, program offerings belong in enrollment, but from a less purist, more business perspective, maybe they don't. Okay. Sorry, can I just ask for clarification? Did you just say that programs are not included in in CM? No, I did not say that. It's program offerings. So the question was, why are you? Uh, it's this question. It's whatever screws everybody up. It's this issue of offering programs. It's just not. It, it's just a concept that sometimes is hard for people to think about. They don't think that there's a lot of distance between approving a program and quote unquote offering it. And so the question was, why is the offering happening in enrollment when the approval happens in the catalog? And again, that's just sort of an art artifact of our very abstracted and purist thinking early on that all, all canonical catalog things happen in curriculum management and all offerings that you might actually attach students to happen in enrollment. So you do the program of approval in curriculum management, you actually quote unquote offer it in enrollment. So I have a related question, if I may. Um, sure. What happens when the list of courses that satisfies a rule evolves because the curriculum committee met and said, well, this year students in this program are now going to get to choose between these five courses instead of these four courses. Is that a new offering or just a new rule? It, it, um, it will depend on your business, on the way your institution views it. I know that's a really murky answer, but it's the, tr it's the right answer. <laughs> if, if, um, if at the approved, if the approved list is take one of these seven courses and then for whatever reason, one fall, one of those seven courses isn't available and so you're going to restrict it to one of six, you may decide that's, that's not really a curricular change. I'm just going to make a new offering. But if you're saying from now on it's only these six, then you may want to go back and update your, your actual catalog offering. So in, so in our case where these things typically change every year for every program, does that mean we're not going to be creating new offerings every year? We're going to be creating new canonical programs every year? I, until I know the more specific, I don't think so, no. I mean, I, that wouldn't be my initial guess. It just, again, it, it depends on the precise scenario and how you, if you view it as a canonical change, then yes, you would change the canonical. If your institution does not view those as changes to the canonical program, then no. To spin it a different way, we see it as the same program, but the rules, the mix of courses, not because they're not offered per se, but just because we're changing the sort of the pathway of students through the program. Uh, mm -hmm. They're going to have to, you know, used to be you took these four courses. Now you can mm -hmm. choose work from a big list. Those sorts yeah. of subtle changes happen all the time. It's, you're still getting the same program, the same degree, whatever. Um, but it's different offerings, definitely different offerings. Okay. And that, and that is only if you want to tightly control, you know, if you want to use the program offering to, to, to track all that. Meaning, if you want to constrain that, you know, students in this program offering um, must take these courses, then you wouldn't want to create a program offering. It, it's kind of, I, I mean, the, the reality is most of our institutions don't really have this concept of a program offering. Usually we just have a code that we attach to a student that tells us what their major is. <laughs> and that's not, at least at the UW, for instance, there's, there's really very little connect between that and what the student enrolls in up until they try to graduate. And then there's a whole set of rules that we apply to them, right? But in between that, you know, there's, no, there's not a lot of places that says, you know, Carol has to take in the enrollment, there's not a lot of restriction about or, pa or planning purposes or paths that tell me what I need to take as a, as a particular major that live in the system. Most of that stuff lives outside the system right now. So I think that's why we're struggling a little bit with program offering is because it is, it's such a different beast to different institutions, and different institutions have such varying levels of ex 
experience and depth with the concept of program offering, which is why, I mean, pretty much everybody treats course offerings in, in kind of the same way. <laughs> the program offerings is sort of all over the map. So I, I think until people actually start implementing it and using it, you know, that will really help us understand the best ways to build out program offering more. Very unsatisfying answers, I realize. <laughs> but a lot of this will get figured out as institutions actually try to apply these concepts. I feel like that's a terrible answer to end on, though. <laughs> so I'm hoping someone has another question that I can answer more uh, concretely. I don't know, Dan, you're, um, you're in the process of implementing at UMD. Do you have any words of wisdom? put you on the spot. Okay, now can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, good. I had 18 mutes on because I'm in a group here. Um, <laughs> it is going to be something that each institution has to think about when they play with it. I was thinking through your example, and for Maryland, if we had a situation in which a curriculum changed to the extent that they had a three-course sequence that made up a requirement and then changed that to be that, well, now it's a three-course sequence. It's one of or maybe two of 15 possible courses to meet that requirement. That would be a new version of a canonical program for us in so much as we would want to update our catalog to reflect that to users consuming those requirements. So that's one way we would play with that. When it comes to the offering, that still gets a little murky, and we haven't gotten to the layer of really playing in the offering land yet, because right now we're still loving the curriculum implementation at the canonical level. Loving is in quotes. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so given the fact that how, normally we would follow this session up with a, with, um, a two-hour session next Thursday, but given that the holidays are, start, are upon us and um, the project is um, going a little bit quiet starting next week for the next two weeks, um, not doing standard meetings, we've decided to do a larger or, or do a session next year, early next year. I believe it's scheduled for January 14th upon the wiki page. But actually it will be a recap of modules one through four. So it will give anybody um, the chance to ask questions about anything we've covered to date. And um, hopefully that will kind of ease us back into to the, uh, to the training sessions. And then we have sessions five in January, which will be about the academic record, which is kind of the the, thing, the, the glue that holds all this together. Um, and then we'll wrap up with academic planning and some other extraneous topics. So as always, you can find our schedule on the conference on the wiki, um, our training page, which we have plenty of links there. Um, there is a link to an evaluation for this training session. Um, so I would ask people to complete, participants to complete. And um, I think that's all we have. I don't know, Steve and Mike, is there anything else? Nope. No, that's it for my end. Okay, so uh, the next session, um, to be specific, it's January 11th. So it'll be Thursday, January 11th. Um, and it'll be, uh, it's actually, we've got four hours set aside to do recap, because I'm assuming University of Toronto in particular are going to be digging into materials and they may have more questions. So we have four hours set aside on January 11th to cover any questions that have come up in your self-study about any of our materials. Um, and then we've got Module 5, January 25th, and uh, Module 6, February 8th. And then that will conclude our mini-series of, of training sessions. So. so if no one has any questions, I wish you um, a very happy and restful holiday, and um, we will see you next year.
See you next year. Thank you.